The Senate will come to order. Members remaining under motions and resolutions, we will revert to the eighth order of business, introduction and first reading of Senate files. There's one introduction to read at the desk. The secretary will report the bill. Senators Hoffman, Rasmussen, Dedzik, Johnson, and Maquaid introduce Senate file 3363, a bill for an act relating to human services, providing for a nursing facility workforce incentive program. Senator Dedzik for a motion to lay Senate file, the Senate file on the table. President, Mr. President, I move that Senate file 3363 be laid on the table. All in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed say no. The motion prevails. Remaining under motions and resolutions, we'll revert to the third order of business, messages from the House. The Secretary will read the message. Mr. President, I have the honor to announce the passage by the House of the following House file herewith transmitted. House file number 3342, signed Patrick D. Murphy, Chief Clerk, House of Representatives. Members, the next order of business is the fourth order of business, the first reading of House files. The Secretary will give the House file its first reading. House file number 3342, a bill for an act relating to human services, providing for a nursing facility workforce incentive program. Members, I'm calling on Senator Desick for a motion. Thank you, Mr. President. I move that an urgency be declared within the meaning of Article 4, Section 19 of the Constitution of Minnesota with respect to House file number 3342, and that the rules of the Senate be so far suspended as to give House file number 3342 its second and third reading and place it on its final passage. Members, this is for suspension of the rules. Senator Disick moves that an urgency be declared within the meeting of Article 4, Section 19 of the Constitution of Minnesota. With respect to House file number 3342, and that the rules of the Senate be so far suspended to, as to give House file 3342 a second and third reading and place it on final passes. On that motion, all in favor say aye. aye. All opposed say no. The motion prevails. We need to give uh, House file number 3342 a second reading before um, Senator Hoffman explains it. House file 3342. Uh, Senator Hoffman, uh, second reading. Senator Hoffman, please explain the bill. Mr. President and members, in front of you, the Nursing Facility Relief Bill, it's House File 3342. It simply breaks into three uh, categories, and, and I'll explain those in depth. The first one is a Nursing Facility Workforce Incentive Grant Program. The second one is payments to nursing facilities. And the third one, Mr. President, is nursing facility temporary daily rate add-ons, and that's the state share dollars. And what this is, Mr. President, as we go into is addressing the concern that this body started um, when we first passed the Human Services Bill a while ago. And we had talked about the impending need for relief to our senior citizens, specifically those in nursing homes. And so when I look at our colleagues in front of us here, I want to point out a couple specifically that took on uh, the example of, of what it means to be bipartisan and also looking at uh, getting an end result. The Senator Rasmussen and Senator May Quaid uh, really did due diligent work on behalf of the Senate and on behalf of what we needed to do in order to get something like this passed. And so as we're going into this, I want to point out this puts money directly to the nursing home facilities that we had a great debate on here. And if I want to point out one person that I should have yielded to a long time ago to ask me to explain DWRS, I want to credit that Senator Gary Dames, when he jumped up and he started talking about his hometown nursing home, right? And he started talking about the facility. That turned a spotlight. That had everybody in this chamber really talking about it. And I want to thank uh, everybody who's kept this vision alive to take care of Gramp and Gram. And so with that, Mr. President, I will not speak anymore except later on, I just give to you the House File 3342. Senator Rasmussen. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, and I thank uh, Senator Hoffman, Senator May Quaid, uh, Senator Johnson, and Senator Dietzik for working to get this done. I um, also really want to thank uh, Senate Counsel uh, Liam Monahan, uh, worked really hard along with uh, House Research um, on a quick timeline to get this bill drafted and before us today. Um, 
Members, our nursing homes are in crisis. Uh, through a combination of inflation and the impacts of COVID, uh, our nursing homes are in a distressed financial state. In greater Minnesota, 17% of our nursing homes have no financial reserves, and 12% are considering closing. Um, and those aren't just statistics, Mr. President, members. We've been hearing their stories throughout this session. I've heard from nursing home providers who don't know if they're going to make it through the end of this year financially and may have to send their residents to other facilities. I've heard from concerned families who didn't know where a grandmother or a parent in need would be able to go to receive the care they need. I've heard about waiting lists and having to send loved ones hours away to other facilities where they're away from their family and familiar surroundings. I'm really proud that Senate Republicans fought hard uh, for this as a priority and for this nursing home rescue package. And I'm proud that we're here today to deliver for our seniors and their family. The long-term care uh, imperative has said that this bill could save up to 40 nursing homes from closing here in the state of Minnesota. And if we take all of the financial measures that are in this package, it adds up to about $1.1 million on average uh, for Minnesota nursing homes. Um, so there's three parts of the bill that I'll just talk through briefly and how they're going to impact our nursing homes as a part of this rescue package. The first are nursing facility grants that total $173.5 million. Um, and we're going to be getting that first payment out to these nursing homes on August 1st of this year which I believe is really important. Each nursing home will receive at least $225,000 plus additional funds that are based on the number of beds that they have. The average nursing home um, could see about $465,000 in this grant funding that's designed to shore up their financial uh, situation. In addition, Mr. President, staffing uh, is the key concern that nursing homes have and the key challenge that they face. So in this package, there's $51.5 million in state money that will leverage federal funds to enable a temporary uh, increase in the daily rate of $12.32 for the next 18 months. And from talking with nursing home administrators, they believe that this will allow them to fund a $1 uh, per hour wage increase to help them attract and retain staff. In addition, there's $75 million in a workforce incentive fund that facilities can use for hiring and retention bonuses, for other benefits, for child care, uh, for employee contributions to 401ks uh, that could total up to $3,000 per worker per year. And that funding will actually be available through July uh, of 2029. And so, Mr. President and members, this is a urgently needed rescue package for Minnesota's nursing homes. I'm proud of the work that we've done here today, and I would ask for members' support. Member Senator May Quaid. Thank you, Mr. President, and I want to thank Senator Hoffman, Senator Rasmussen, Leader Dietzik, and Minority Leader Johnson for their work. I think when uh, a deal was struck and they said, we're going to send $300 million to nursing homes, everyone was like, great, let's just write checks. And it's actually really complicated. And I am so grateful to both my colleague, Senator Rasmussen, for sitting in a room with me to figure out the details, and the Department of Human Services for sitting in that room figuring out how we were going to get that done. Um, this really would not have been possible without a broader agreement on bonding that frees up this money to we, so we can ensure that Minnesotans who live in nursing facilities can have that extra support, that the buildings and the people who serve them are able to be supported. I am so proud of the work that we have done here. I'm really grateful that we get the opportunity to vote on this. I'm going to urge members to vote green. Senator Dames. Thank you, Mr. President and members. First, I want to thank the team that put this process together and that put this bill together. I know it took a lot of hard work. But I also, it's been a long time for this to get here. We started out with a bonding bill in the middle of March, and that bonding bill was defeated, much to the skin of other people. And it was defeated because as Republicans, we felt that was the only opportunity we were going to have to get some of the things we needed. It was kind of an interesting era back in March because it was kind of the 
worst of politics, and in some cases, worst of politicians. We had a chair of a bonding committee. Her or her staff called into my district and talked to some of the people who had a bonding project in, my, in this bill and told them that if they didn't convince their senator to, to vote for it, that the bill would not be in the bonding, would not end up in the bonding bill. And like I say, that's kind of uh, the worst of politics and the worst of politicians. But you know, I guess everything is fair in this process, so we moved on from there. And I would just like to thank my Republican colleagues for sticking together, knowing that if we stuck together, we would have an opportunity to make a difference at some point. And we did that. I think it's interesting that we have a 19 and had a half had a 19 and a half billion dollar surplus. We have about 10 billion dollars that's going to be spent in new taxes and new fees. And yet, for almost five months, we turned our back on the most vulnerable people, our people in the nursing homes. We closed the door, shut the lights out, and said, you're on your own. Some of us said, no, that's not going to happen that way. And some of us fought hard to try to change that. And I know that Senator Abler and Senator Huffman fought very, very hard to try to get the bill through the conference committee and have enough money to make it so the nursing homes could survive. But it didn't turn out that way because other people had different ideas. Like I say, it's been a long road. And to this day, I don't understand what the governor and many of the DFL members have against nursing homes and against elder, elderly. But if you've been paying attention for the last five months, you can pretty well see that there is an issue there. As Republicans, we have said all along, we said last year, and it was kind of interesting, as the discussions went on this year, we would hear about how if the Republicans would have done their job last year, well, some of the people making those comments weren't around here last year. So they either they were guessing or using hearsay. Either way, it's a dangerous thing. And I reminded people one other time, some of our political friends, is the only thing a politician has is his word. And it's kind of interesting when people haven't been here and yet have all the ideas of just what happened. So I'd just like to remind folks, we fought very hard to get a almost $900 million dollar bill passed last year. It was passed off the Senate floor. It was bipartisan. It got killed in the House with the DFL, and the governor would not support it. So if you have any questions about why that didn't happen, it was just explained to you. This year, how many times have we tried to get funding for the nursing homes? We've tried many a times, and the door was always closed by a 34-33 vote. I found it very interesting that we have people that have the same nursing home situations as many of us in rural Minnesota do, and yet you could talk about how you supported the nursing homes, but you voted against it. Some people even went as far as saying, there's nothing I can do about it. There isn't a single person in the majority that couldn't have done something about it. If you took, had your vote and voted with us, we would have got nursing home funding a long time ago but you hid behind the shield, I can't do nothing about it. So we kept pushing and pushing. We were threatened that if we didn't do something, we'd go to an all-cash bonding bill and there'd be no projects of the Republicans in it. Well, I know there was a lot of hearings done and Republican projects were not heard. Understand that. I know that there was a lot of our projects taken out. I understand that. But at the end of the day, we had the strength and the commitment to stand together. Now, granted, we originally were looking for tax relief for Social Security. When the opportunity came, and I fully believed that the DFL at some point would understand you can't kick your parents to the curb 
You gotta have responsibility for your parents, your friends, and your neighbors that are in a nursing home. You gotta step up and you gotta take care of them. And I really felt that at some point that compassion would show up and we would do that. It did not happen. So when it come time to negotiate the bonding bill, nursing homes became the top priority. And I honest to God believe that if the Republican Senate caucus would not have stuck together, voted down that March bill, that we would not be talking about what we're talking about today because there would have been no opportunity to help the nursing homes. That was, the bonding bill agreement was made, and I am very, very happy that tonight we're standing here, and as Senator Rassman laid out, how the money is going to be distributed, how it's going to help the nursing homes. And I know in my district, it is going to make a major difference in our small rural nursing homes. This is a lifeline they're going to need to survive until we can get the payment process straightened out and get the 20 month, 21 month waiting, 21 month period waiting period down to a lesser amount so that they have a better cash flow system. So with that said, I'm glad that we're here this evening. I'm glad that, that that got resolved. And I know that we have a lot of senior citizens that are thanking God that as, po that as politicians, we came to our senses and that we are doing the right thing. And the right thing is what's happening here tonight. We're taking $300 million, we're distribu distributing it in a sense and a manner that can keep these nursing homes surviving and these older folks understand, our seniors understand, after this bill is completed, that they don't have to worry about where they're going to go when their nursing home closes, because that has been a big issue. So with that said, I would just like to thank my colleagues for making this happen, and we certainly are helping our elderly. Thank you. Senator Johnson. Thank you, Mr. President. I appreciate the opportunity to speak on behalf of this bill tonight and on behalf of our caucus. Throughout this year, Senate Republicans have been listening to their districts. We've been listening to the people who sent us here. One of those groups is the elderly, is the vulnerable. that live in nursing homes throughout Republican districts and Democrat districts. We heard over and over about the issues that were going on within those institutions. We've come up with a solution. I want to thank Senator Rasmussen. Folks, if you haven't seen Senator Rasmussen behind closed doors working on bills, it's a treat. He's like a maestro back there figuring out how these solutions come together. I want to thank you for that. I'd also like to thank Senator Dietzik for her bipartisan work in broaching these negotiations towards the end of session here. It was a joy to work with her and finally get a solution that Minnesotans have been crying out for, for some time. We saw earlier this week a bill that came through, the Human Services Bill, with abysmal funding for nursing homes. Abysmal. Zeroed out almost $100 million that could have helped nursing homes. And then on top of that, put $100 million into a loan program for dis financially distressed nursing homes. It's like watching a guy drowning and them handing him a bottle of water and saying, don't worry about it, you can get me another when you get out of there. It doesn't help. Every single Senate Democrat was willing to spend billions on government growth and on special interests, leaving nursing homes high and dry we saw that, we saw the votes, it's provable. So you can say what you want when you go back home, or you can say what you want online, but the truth is gonna be said on the floor here today. Senate Republicans secured this funding to protect our institutions across the state. These aren't big donors, these aren't people that just reside in our district, these aren't just special interests that, that care about us getting elected so we have power, these are vulnerable, adults and people across our state that were crying out for help 
and yet we're spending $500 million on office buildings down here. Folks, where are our priorities? This is our priority. This is Senate Republican priority. When Democrats refused to do the right thing, Senate Republicans went to the mat to ensure that they were taken care of. And we will do that again and again to do the right thing in this state. And I am so proud of our team and the people who participated. Folks, we're going to get beat up because we spent money, right? Our right side is going to beat us up because we spent a lot of money. And the left and the Democrats, they don't care. Demonstrated within their votes. We're standing up for the right thing in this state. That's what Republicans do. Working together to figure out ways that we can solve these problems and impact daily lives for vulnerable, for the elderly. So I'm proud of this. I'm proud of this bill. I'm proud of the work that we did. Folks, I encourage a green vote for this state, for these people, for the right thing. Senate Majority Leader Kerry Diesick. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, throughout the 2023 legislative session, we, many of us, all of us, have been working to ensure that Minnesota seniors have access to high quality care in the nursing homes and that workers who deliver that care have the wages and benefits that they need to live their lives. I mean, I know we heard that the Democrats don't care, but we continue to fight for the nursing homes and the workers. I know I heard from my local nursing homes. I know all of us heard from our local nursing homes. We know that there is a crisis in long-term care throughout our state. We know they're struggling. We know families are struggling. We know seniors are struggling. We listened. And if we didn't listen enough, Senator Hoffman reminded us. He kept fighting and repeatedly told us we need to listen to them and do more to help the nursing, nursing homes. And it's not about the nursing homes, it's about the seniors that are living in those nursing homes and the impact on their families and those communities. So this bill came together through the negotiation process and I enjoyed working with Senator Johnson and our counterparts uh, over in the House, Speaker Hortman and Leader Damoth. And um, it was a, a lot of good discussion and we got this bill done. I, I want to thank the staff who worked on all three of these bills, these binding bill packages, nonstop in the last 24, 48 hours because they worked miracles to get this done in a timely fashion. So again, thank you to those staff and the revisers and the um, Senate fiscal, Senate council, the revisers, the engrosser team, everybody, because it is 8.30 tonight and we passed three very historic pieces of a bonding package. Uh, I also want to thank Senator McQuaid and Senator Rasmussen because they sat down, as you heard, and really dug deep into the details and found a solution. And I want to thank, again, Senator Hoffman and Senator Abler for their tireless efforts on behalf of seniors in nursing homes over the past two years. You know, they kept saying, Senator Hoffman kept bugging me all the time, I need more money. I need 50 million, I need 200 million, I need 300 million. He didn't let up. And many of us kept looking to find money because we know this is about seniors and this is about their families. If that nursing, clo nursing home close, who is gonna take care of grandma or grandpa? Somebody is gonna have to stay home and hope that they are qualified and able to help them. And then that is somebody who might no longer be able to work and we have a worker shortage and that impacts not just that family but the entire community. The human services bill that we passed last week was the largest investment for our seniors and our care workers in the state history. But with this effort, this joint effort that we are passing tonight, we will provide an additional 300 million to help address the immediate needs of our nursing homes, the crisis that they are facing. And it will help those seniors and those families and it will give them that comfort and security that those seniors will get the care they need. This was a priority for every one of us in this chamber because each and every one of us have a nursing home in our district and those seniors that need help. So this isn't a Democrat bill, this isn't a Republican bill, this is a bipartisan bill to help communities and families across the state. And putting this bill together was a team effort. 
So I want to thank everybody involved. I want to thank all of you for your passion that you've shown on this issue, and I encourage a yes vote. Last voice before we vote will be that of the author of, of House File 3342, Senator Hoffman. Thank you, Mr. President. You heard from everybody that talked about the process. And I want to say I am grateful to this body for allowing me to be able to be a singular voice. But together, there were 67 of us. And I'm really grateful that Senator Dietzik and Senator Johnson could see that common cause and say this is what it's about. Grateful to the Department of Human Services for sitting there and absolutely negotiating. And it wasn't really negotiation. I want to say it was a conversation and it was joy. When I walked in to see the conversation and to be there, it was joyful. It was joyful because they were trying to get to the end to say what's right for grandpa and grandma. And Mr. President, um, with that, I'm grateful for this body and I would hope we can all be grateful for our grandparents and say yes to this uh, bill. Thank you. So quickly, this, the uh, secretary will give the bill its third reading. House file number 3342, a bill for an act relating to human services, providing an, for a nursing facility workforce incentive program, et cetera. Third reading. The secretary will take the, will, will take the final roll on House file 3342 as amended. Members, please vote. Senator voting for those voting under Rule 40.7. 40, 40. Thank you, Mr. President. I report that Senator Mann votes aye. Senator Mann votes aye. Senator Port votes aye. Senator Port votes aye. Senator McEwen votes aye. Senator McEwen votes aye. Senator Morrison votes aye. Senator Morrison votes aye. And Senator Klein votes aye. And Senator Klein votes aye. Senator Rasmussen, for those voting under Rule 40.7. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Barr votes aye. Senator Barr votes aye. Senator Duckworth votes aye. Senator Duckworth votes aye. And thank you, Mr. President. Senator Pratt votes aye. And Senator Pratt votes aye. All senators having voted who desires to vote, the secretary will close the roll. There have been 67 ayes and zero noes. The bill is passed and its title agreed to. <laughs> Members remaining under the order of business of motions and resolutions, I am now going to recognize Senator Latz. Senator Last, this will be for a special order. I believe it's House 5 447. Is that the one we're talking about? Correct, Mr. President. House File 447. So do you have a motion, Senator Latz? Uh, Mr. President, I move to amend House File 447 with the A51 amendment. Senator Latz moves the A51 amendment. And the secretary will report the A51 amendment. Senator Latz moves to amend House File number 447 as follows. Delete everything after the enacting clause and insert. This is the A51 amendment. Senator Latz to your A51 amendment. Uh, Mr. President and members, this is the, uh, the final uh, corrections, technical corrections work uh, for this legislative session. Um, it includes a correction of the competency board appropriation. Uh, it deletes a redundant appropriation um, in the Health and Human Services omnibus bill. Um, it corrects an effective date in the jobs policy bill. Um, it it, it uh, reinserts a meat processing provision in the bonding bill that was inadvertently dropped in the drafting process. Um, every provision here has been approved by all of the uh, the appropriate bodies on a bipartisan basis here in the Senate, um, including uh, the, uh, the leadership of, of both caucuses on the uh, meat processing provision. So I ask for your green vote. Any additional discussion on the A51 amendment? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. aye. All those opposed say no. The motion prevails. The A51 is adopted.
Seeing nothing, uh, no other discussion, the secretary will give the bill its third reading. Bill number 447, a bill for an act relating to civil law, amending certain policy provisions related to forfeiture, name change, property, survival, cause of action after death, etc. Third reading. Any further discussion? Seeing none, the secretary will take the roll on House File 447 as amended. Members, please vote. Senator Bowden, for those voting under Rule 40.7. Thank you, Mr. President. I report that Senator Mann votes aye. Senator Mann votes aye. Senator Port votes aye. Senator Port votes aye. Senator McEwen votes aye. Senator McEwen votes aye. Senator Morrison votes aye. Senator Morrison votes aye. And Senator Klein votes aye. And Senator Klein votes aye. Senator Rasmussen, for those voting under Rule 40.7. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Barr votes no. Senator Barr votes no. Senator Duckworth votes aye. Senator Duckworth votes aye. And thank you, Mr. President. Senator Pratt votes aye. And Senator Pratt votes aye. I'm sorry, the secretary uh, um, uh, was, was trying to record everything and did not. Uh, Senator Bowden, would you be so kind as to go back through your uh, votes pursuant to Rule 40.7. Yes, Mr. President. Senator Mann votes aye. Senator Mann votes aye. Senator Port votes aye. Senator Port votes aye. Senator McEwen votes aye. Senator McEwen votes aye. Senator Morrison votes aye. Senator Morrison votes aye. And Senator Klein votes aye. And Senator Klein votes aye. Senator Ress, are you planning to vote? Senator Ress, are you going to vote? Senator Rasmussen, for those voting under Rule 40.7. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Barr votes no. Senator Barr votes no. Senator Duckworth votes aye. Senator Duckworth votes aye. And thank you, Mr. President. Senator Pratt votes aye. Senator Pratt votes aye. All senators having voted who desires to vote, the secretary will close the roll. There have been 51 ayes and 14 noes. The bill is passed and its title agreed to. <laughs> Senator Dizek for a motion to recess because we still have one more bill to do. Senator Dizek. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, members, so the the um, in case you haven't known, we have been working most of the day on the what well, was formerly the Nurses at the Bedside Act and now is um, another nurses bill. The conference committee report has been signed. It should be posted momentarily. We are just waiting for that. Uh, it, we're going to recess, but ask that you stick in the vicinity. Um, we believe it could be posted in 10 to 15 minutes. So... Senator Dizek, your motion is for us to recess for 15 minutes? At the for call of the president, and we ask for people to uh, stay near the chamber. On that motion, any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. Oh, what are you pointing to? No, we're not letting you do it. <laughs> all in favor say aye. Oh. Mr. President, was it just posted? Oh, it, it was just posted? Oh, we need to receive it, so I guess we're going to wait. So, um, hey, Chris. Okay. All in favor say aye. aye. All those opposed say no. no. Don't try it, you all. The, the Senate is in recess uh, until the call of the president. <laughs> I saw you, Senator Housley, just getting them.
Members remaining under the order of business and motions and resolutions, uh, I am going to explain what we're trying to do. I am now, first of all, going to call the Senate to order and remaining under the order of business of motions and resolutions. Let me explain to you what we're going to do. The, um, the report came over to us, but there is a, and, and there's a mistake in the report. So they have to send it back. But what, what the leaders have decided is that we should talk about it so that once it gets here, we already know what it says and, and we can move expeditiously once it gets here. That was decided amongst the leadership, so I just want to let you know that, that this isn't something that I'm doing just on my own. So with that being said, Senator Murphy is going to talk about what's in the conference committee report, and then we can answer any questions related to it. Senator Murphy, to talk about it, although no official action can happen on it because we do not have it physically uh, before the body. Senator, Senator Murphy. Uh, thank you, Mr. President and members. Uh, I am happy to be uh, here tonight to talk about Senate File 1384. 1384 is the Nurse and Patient Safety Act. It replaces the Keeping the Nurses at the Bedside Act that essentially passed away a little earlier this evening. Before I talk about this legislation, I want to say a significant number of thank yous. Um, the work that we have done on this legislation mirrors what we have been doing together all session making significant transformative change for the people of Minnesota, and none of us does that by ourselves. Uh, and this work, of course, the bill before us, when you see it, is not something new, but instead a skinnied down version of what we have been working on in both bodies all session. Uh, so it's a subtraction and not an addition in the the issues in this bill, you will recognize them when I talk about them. But first, to the thank yous. I want to thank the people who work with me in the office I hold, Teresa Mosier and Alexis Kesey, who have been tireless, really tireless, uh, in their efforts all session, but particularly on this because they know how important it has been to me and to the people of Minnesota. I want to thank Liam Monahan, who has pitched in admirably, quietly, forcefully to take a room of people, including me, uh, to a place of clarity um, to put together this piece of legislation. I want to thank Eric Nauman, who has pitched in to make sure um, that the appropriations that were carried in the Human Services Bill that we passed earlier today under the leadership of Senator Wickland are expressed here as well. I want to thank the revisers who have been working around the clock for all of us, but in addition um, on this piece of legislation. I can't say enough about Leader Dietzik today um, and really around this issue and so many issues. She's been a force and in this she has been my partner to make sure that we were able to find a pathway forward for nurses and for patients in their care. And this legislation really is about nurses and direct care, direct health care workers uh, and the patients in their care. And, and Leader Dietzik has been a, a real partner in this, and I'm incredibly grateful. Uh, my colleagues on the conference committee, uh, Senator and Registered Nurse Liz Bolden, and excuse me, Senator Abler, um, former representative, now Senator Abler, who uh, has been true to his word, a creative partner, a problem solver, and this legislation is stronger because of his input. I want to thank the co-authors on this legislation. I want to thank Senator Wickland for carrying these provisions in the Human Services and the Health and Human Services Conference Report until we pulled them out. And I want to thank everybody in the body. I know that this has been an issue that has grown very contentious. Uh, for many, many reasons, which I'll talk about. Um, but you've stuck with me, you've supported me, you supported this effort. 
That's important to me, it's important to the nurses, but most importantly, it's important to Minnesotans who one day will be patients in the care of registered nurses and direct care workers. Uh, it's also important to note my brothers and sisters in labor, in SEIU Healthcare, AFSCME Council 65, the AFL-CIO, and of course the registered nurses um, who have been fighting for this for so many years. I want to thank people for their care, especially the nurses, for their fight and for never quitting and never ever walking away from patients or the people in your care. And it's why we're here tonight, because you insisted and you kept pushing and reminding us that our job here is to solve problems and to build a future for the people of Minnesota. Senate File 1384 uh, is not going to solve in the way that we conceived um, the nurse staffing crisis that we're experiencing in our hospitals. And I just need to be really honest about that. We came to fight for that. We didn't win that fight. But we won something important for the nurses. Provisions, important provisions that were carried in this bill uh, in Kanaba are now in this, in this bill. And that includes loan forgiveness for people who are studying to become registered nurses. And you all know, we all know, there aren't enough nurses. Um, and we need to keep preparing nurses to come in, especially because we know what nurses are experiencing in our hospitals. In the practice of nursing means they come into the practice, but they leave too quickly. And it's one of the reasons why we have a shortage of nurses practicing in our hospitals right now. So loan forgiveness to make sure that there are people able to come into the practice is important. And this bill carries uh, child care support for the people who are deciding to move from being nursing assistants to registered nurses or licensed practical nurses. That's important support for them. There is an analytical study that will be conducted by an independent study along with the Department of Health to understand why and how many nurses are leaving the bedside. Nurses have been telling us for a very, very long time that they're leaving the practice of nursing because of the moral injury that they're experiencing because of short staffing. They've shown up with stacks and stacks of concern for safe staffing. They've told us their stories over and over and over again. And I think one of the most painful parts of this debate in the last couple of weeks is that they're not sure we're hearing them and they're not sure that we believe them. And they aren't giving up and now in this legislation is not just a voluntary study like we've seen before, but instead a bona fide analytical study so we can together see the information that will help us understand what's happening with our registered nurses in hospitals. And last but not least, and probably the most important provision, is the work, workplace violence prevention portions of this legislation that have been carried in the Keeping the Nurses at the Bedside Act all the way through this is nation-leading work. It's powerful because we know, especially since the pandemic, that registered nurses are getting hurt on the job. They're getting beat on the job. That's true for LPNs, that's true for direct care workers, and sometimes it's impacting patients. And so there's an important body of work here to make sure that we're making our hospitals as safe as we can for that practice of nursing. I'm really proud of that. It's important. So. This is not where we started. It is not all that we wanted. But those of us who have served for a long time know that you don't always get everything you want in a session or in a debate. And the real trick, and Scott Dibble reminded me of this earlier today, Senator Dibble, my friend, that some takes, it takes 10 years or 20 years or actually 30 years to finally realize the vision and put it into place. And I'm willing to continue this fight alongside you, knowing that this is not everything, but this is important, and it's valuable, and it's going to help nurses, and it's going to help patients. And I hope tonight to earn your green vote. Thank you. Members, are there any questions that a, a member has of Senator Murphy? in anticipation of any action that is gonna come later. Uh, Senator May Quaid. Thank you, Mr. President. And just to clarify, you're asking if we have questions of Senator Murphy about what will become before us. That is correct. 
Thank you, Mr. President. Um, my question for Senator Murphy, if she will yield. Actually, Mr. President, may I ask Senator Bolden to yield? Se she will yield. Senator Murphy will yield. Senator uh, Makeway. Mr. President, may I ask Senator Bolden to yield? Oh, Senator Bolden to yield. Senator Bolden, will you yield? She will yield. Senator uh, uh, Makeway. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, Mr. President, I, I am not a nurse. I'm many wonderful things, but I am not a nurse. And my question for Senator Bolden is, what is it like to be a nurse at the bedside? What is it like to serve patients in the hospital right now? Now, Senator uh, Bolden, I know that's a, a pretty large question, and I want you to connect it to uh, the uh, policy that we are considering tonight. Senator Bolden. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator McQuaid, for the question. It is a, a big question, uh, and you know, I could we could talk for another three hours about that question, but I will not. Um, and I'm looking up into the gallery and seeing other folks who could answer that question as well. Um, so I've been a registered nurse uh, for over 20 years, and some of that time has been at the bedside, and there was a chunk in the middle that was not. And it has been interesting coming back to the bedside after being away for about 10 years, and some things are the same, and some things have changed. And some of those things that have changed are directly related to this bill. It is violence at the bedside. It is um, patients and family members and an environment um, where nurses don't feel safe. We are there, we come into this work because we want to take care of people, because we care about people and want to, want to be there to take care of folks. And that is difficult work. Um, it is, there is a weight and a responsibility to that that none of us take lightly. And the level of moral injury that comes to that when we are there because we want to do the very best we can to take care of everyone in our care, but you, we sometimes cannot do that because of many factors, not having the resources, staffing is certainly a piece of that um, for, for many reasons. It is incredibly difficult in a way that is hard to put into words. And the workplace violence piece of this legislation is important and meaningful and will make a difference in the lives of nurses across this state. Um, workplace violence is a significant issue in healthcare, not just for nurses, but for um, aides and uh, providers and uh, lots of folks. And it is something that we are taking action on, and I'm grateful for that in this bill. Um, it, another piece in the bill, the loan forgiveness piece, uh, part of being a nurse is oftentimes carrying significant debt. Um, as I talk to uh, my colleagues and nurses, especially new nurses, and many of them are new, um, you know, right out of college, and um, carrying that level of um, student debt is a, is a weight on them as well. And so this is a, will be another piece that will be helpful and meaningful to folks. And so um, I am grateful for this legislation, and I'll talk later a little bit more about some of those pieces, but... Um, there is a heaviness of nurses at the bedside right now. Um, and I also just, the last thing I'll say is to connect it to something that Senator Murphy said around um, feeling that nurses are listened to and believed. Um, that is not always the case. And so with this legislation and with uh, here tonight, us having this debate and talking about this is important. And I want the message to be clear to nurses across the state that we hear you, we are listening to you, we hear you, and we believe you. We believe your experience of what you are going through and the difficulty you are, are facing and that we are taking steps and taking action to make that better. Senator McQuay. Thank you, Mr. President. I was wondering if Senator Murphy would yield for a question. Senator Murphy, will you yield? She will yield. Senator McQuay. Thank you, Mr. President. Earlier tonight, Senator Murphy said that this um, violence prevention provision in, this, in the bill that will be before us is nation leading. And I'm wondering if she can explain why. Senator Murphy, to the question. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. President and Senator McQuaid. The reason that it is uh, nation leading is because it's comprehensive um, and it is focused specifically on the experiences that people are having in hospitals. Uh, and we have, you know, from the time that I practiced to now, what nurses are experiencing is so much different and it's nurses and, and direct care staff alike in hospitals and other facilities. 
Uh, we hear about it a lot, just like we hear a lot about mental health care. But the reason why, and thank you for the good question, is because it is a comprehensive, comprehensive approach, uh, and we need that. Senator Mayquay. Thank you, Mr. President. Those were all the questions I had about the bill that will be before us. Any other questions for Senator Murphy related to the bill that is going to come before the body? Uh, Senator Abler. Well, thank you, Mr. President. I don't need questions, but would this be a good time to offer comments on the bill? Yes. That may be coming before us soon. Actually, I just signed the report, so it should be pretty soon. Um, so this will just be my thoughts on the bill. I, the Senator, all the people that had a hand in this, I want to commend them all for their diligence and the efforts that they're making. And some people are wondering why we even need this bill. What's the role of the legislature in injecting itself between what some see as a bargaining problem? Um, Mr. President, quite some time ago, there were uh, people who worked for the railroad and uh, in the 30s and so on, and they would be uh, you know, tasking away and putting in the railroad ties and shoveling coal and all that. And every so often, tragically, one of those individuals would get stuck beneath the train and their leg might get cut off. And which would be horrible. And the railroad said, well, gee, that's too bad. We can't have people work for us with legs that are cut off. Uh, you're free to sue us if you want. And out of that, Mr. President, came the workers' comp system. So they decided to relieve the uh, employee of the opportunity to sue the employer over that, but they gave them then the consideration of finding ways to help rehab them. And it's become be quite you know, updated and complex. And at the, it, it was the role of uh, government legislatures at that time to find a way to deal with what was seen as something that was a great problem. And every so often, every year or two, we have a work comp update. Um, and, but sometimes that system just doesn't work uh, because uh, it's hard to always, sometimes see the effect of violence on a worker, particularly when they're in a setting with one person and one patient who may be violent um, and hardly any of those things actually come out of lifting injuries, like you think of a work injury or like a, like a pan hits them on the head or something. But it has to do with uh, very real assaults and others. And it seems to me, uh, Mr. President, I don't know why the work comp thing doesn't work in this, but it doesn't. Uh, I've had opportunities to talk to... Um, well over 100 nurses, I haven't kept track. I just know it's a, a big number and probably 200 nurses over my time um, and as we've had reasons to get together. Um, and it's a very real thing. Mr. President, it is a thing that nurses are getting hurt. And I don't think the employers are disinterested, but I don't know that they know what to do about it. And we've talked about this, I don't know, Senator Murphy, a decade or longer about this problem. And... And, and so, you know, the, the pure answer, Mr. President, many would say, well, is it just, well, let the employer handle this. This is a workplace issue. It's not our business. Um, but, Mr. President, every so often, some things happen where people are getting hurt, and we have to intervene. We intervene in child, in child protection cases because the family can't work it out. Why couldn't they work it out? Why couldn't the neighbors help them? Well, we pass a law. We create a system. Mr. President, it is time for a system like this for us to weigh in on. And I think that this, this remnant of what was brought before uh, is actually going to make a big difference. And to the rest of the bill that we're not talking about anymore, um, what's lacking, Mr. President, I believe that I talked to both. I'm, I'm not anti-hospital. I'm pro-hospital. I discussed this morning we need to put money into hospitals. Uh, and I see myself as friends to both. And I think from that perch, not being a nurse, married to a nurse, um, and from being interested in the healthcare side for all these years here, um, I see myself in a position to understand both sides. And healthcare has become very challenging uh, with the economic side and the staffing side and COVID and all. But I think that um, building a team, building people on a, on a common ground to advance the, the purpose of the hospital, which is for patient care, I think is really constructive. And as I help to design those committees where the nurses have a real voice, where management has a real voice, 
that I thought that was productive. In the same way, Mr. President, that the House has a plan, the Senate has a plan, and make them go to a conference committee and work it out. And sometimes you need the pressure of time to get those put together. Sometimes they get done at the last minute, sometimes they're done early. Um, but Mr. President, this bill and the form it's at now will make a very constructive difference. And I don't know it's gonna go as far as the other bill to draw nurses back into the workforce, but maybe it will because they'll know that they might be safe. Because Mr. President, there's no nurse I know who plans to go to work and come home, comes home injured. Like an iron worker working 30 stories above the ground might realize he's got a or she has a dangerous job. I don't think people in a nursing think, boy, I could, I could become uh, disabled at the age of 26. You know, that's never on their, they just wanna go help people. So I have been pleased to be a part of this for I don't know how many years, but I, it's a real thing, Mr. President. This is a solution. Uh, there's emails from Mayo and the Hospital Association. Um, I think that's who these are from. Um, that are they're comfortable with. They're comfortable with this. Yeah, Mayo and um, yeah, the hospitals. Um, and and I'm, I'm pleased that they're willing to stand up. And, and say that this is a good idea. And I think, Mr. President, building on this good idea, I think there's hope for the future, not to have a combative future relationship with the hospitals and the nurses, but to build a bridge and a collegiality that makes the next step more possible. So I wanna thank the hospitals and the Mayo for engaging here. I wanna thank the nurses for realizing this is a great opportunity to get a major thing done, nation leading. And so Mr. President, I urge members, when they get around to it, to vote green. Thank you. Thank you. Members, just so that we're clear, the leader's plan was for us to have brief comments now. So once the bill is before us, we can move expeditiously forward. Okay? So we want to use our time wisely. That's what we're trying to do. And we want to be as brief as possible. Senator Bowden. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, briefly, I want to extend my thanks to Senator Murphy for her fierce advocacy for this bill and for nurses. As a fellow registered nurse, it has been uh, a privilege and a joy to work on this with her and also with the nurses who have shared their voices to put to this legislation. And while this bill does not represent all the work that we want to do and need to do to support nurses, it is needed necessary and meaningful. Um, so I am grateful to have um, been on the conference committee for this bill and to be able to, to work on it and work towards it. And I think it is especially meaningful um, to me to be able to cap off this legislative session with this work in a session where we have really focused on the rights of workers and safe working environments and not leaving people behind. When I think about paid family and medical leave, when I think about uh, the HHS bill we passed earlier today around including all all of our undocumented neighbors uh, into healthcare, we are, have been focused on not leaving people behind. And it is meaningful to me that we are ending this session by not leaving nurses behind and passing legislation that will support them in their work. So I would encourage everyone to vote green. Senator Mayquay. Thank you, Mr. President, and I, I'll apologize. I was trying to follow the exact instructions you gave before, which was to ask questions, but I do have comments on the bill. Um, Mr. President, my daughter has been in the hospital more times than I ever imagined a child could be in the hospital in the one year that she's been alive. And I talk about being a mom a lot, but I don't talk about her a lot. When she's in the hospital, her stats drop. She doesn't breathe very well. And the people who run into her room when her oxygen drops below 80 are the nurses. The people who hold me when I cry after we hold her down to suction out her nose are the nurses. The first person she reached for, aside from me or my wife in a week, was Nurse Keisha at Children's Hospital. When nurses tell us that they are caring for too many patients to keep them safe, we have to believe them. There is literally nobody else between the patient and the provider, they are the ones, nurses are the ones providing the care. I'm furious that corporate interests, that people who make millions of dollars, like millions of dollars, in some cases 31 to one ratio to the nurses, the people who have the profit motivation 
to have less people in a building somehow got an equal or greater voice in this conversation than the people who provide the care. Infuriating. What other motivation could nurses possibly have than to say we want safe staffing ratios than the care of patients? There's no other motivation. I love nurses. I'm so grateful to them for the work that they have done before the pandemic, certainly through the pandemic, and now where care has changed. And so, Mr. President, I know that we didn't get everything we wanted in this bill. We will keep fighting. But to be nation leading in violence prevention, I feel good about that. To do student loan forgiveness, I feel good about that. To have actual nurses in this caucus leading this charge, I feel good about that. So I'm gonna keep on the fight with nurses, and I'm gonna keep this fire in my belly, because I know that should we end up in the hospital again, with my beautiful daughter, the people running into her room to make sure that she stays alive are the nurses, which means I will come here every single day and fight for them so they can continue to provide the excellent care to their patients that they do now. Thank you. Senator Nelson. Thank you, Mr. President. Well, uh, I, I appreciate the comments and I think probably every one of us here uh, has a story and an experience about the value and the importance of nurses. If you or your loved one has ever been in the hospital or had any type of surgery, uh, we know how important nurses are. And we know how important uh, their safety is as well as the safety and well-being of the patients. But I do have a question. And I just um, am looking at the conference committee report, which we'll be voting on soon here, which was just posted. And my question is this. It's uh, section 12 of the conference committee report, uh, subdivision 31. And I just want to read the underlying language and ask the uh, author, uh, which I believe would be uh, Senator Murphy, to explain what it means. Um, the new language says that by the 93rd legislature, let's see, by the 93rd, by the 93rd, in legislative enactment by the 93rd legislature, provisions substantially similar to Senate File 23 I mean, to Senate file 2020, excuse me, similar to 2023 Senate file 1561, the second engrossment, Article 2. So I went to Senate file 1561 of this year, second engrossment, Article 2. And that is the article that has caused such concern and that does deal with hospital staffing and staffing ratios. I thought that, or hospital staffing, and my understanding was that was not part of what is coming back to us now in this conference committee report. And I would uh, ask the uh, Senator Murphy, our author, to, if she would yield and explain uh, what uh, that means uh, in the conference committee report where it says, uh, in a, it, it, it says that the appropriation in this subdivision is contingent upon legislative enactment of provisions substantially similar to 2023 Senate File 1561, the second engrossment, Article 2. And that is the hospital staffing article. So I would ask Senator McQuaid, or I mean, excuse me, Senator Murphy, to um, explain um, that particular provision which was the provision that there was disagreement on. Senator Murphy, to the question. Thank you, Mr. President, and thank you, Senator Nelson. As you will likely recall, the, the costs for what was Keeping Nurses at the Bedside Act were carried in the Health and Human Services Conference Committee that we passed earlier. Um, and as we put this uh, compromise bill together, uh, this afternoon, knowing that that bill had passed, uh, as I understand it, uh, on the recommendation of our staff, 
uh, it was decided that it would be best to hold that appropriation in, as it was described, not with the language, because that language no longer exists, but hold that appropriation at the Department of Human Services uh, for perhaps a similarly situated study or review. Um, it is no commitment to the work. It is no reflection of uh, what will come in the future, but instead a reference to where uh, that money was headed to uh, for the purposes of clarity, for the purposes of transparency, um, and to make sure that there was a container for those funds um, at the Department of Human Services, et cetera. Senator Nelson. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. President. Uh, thank you, Senator Murphy. So that is important to get uh, certainly clarity on that, that uh, it does not apply here uh, because this section of the bill has not been enacted or will, is not part of the conference committee. So and then, then my second question is, are there funds then that are, are already allocated to, uh, are they, I thought I might have heard Senator Murphy say that funds would be, are already being allocated for something that is not being enacted. And I would like some clarity on that, please. Senator, Senator, if Senator Murphy would yield, Mr. President. Senator Murphy. Uh, thank you, Mr. President and Senator Nelson. There is in the Health and Human Services Bill that has already moved uh, funding for loan forgiveness for the administration of loan forgiveness and for the activities of the workforce study, that analytical study at the Department of Health. Senator Nelson. Well, thank you, um, uh, Senator Murphy. It's, it's still a little bit unclear if those funds have been uh, allocated to the Department of Health for something that is, has, that is not being covered in the conference committee report that will be coming to our desk soon. I'm just reading it uh, online right now. Uh, and so again, that's a bit confusing if we're setting money aside for something that has not yet been enacted. Members, we now have the conference committee report. We'd like to move forward on the conference committee report. Senator Murphy, uh, if you'd like to make your motions. Thank you, Mr. President. I move that the foregoing recommendations and conference committee report on Senate File 1384 be now adopted and that the bill be repassed as amended by the conference committee. Member and I Senator ask for a roll call. Member Senator Murphy moved that the foregoing recommendations and conference, conference committee report on Senate File 1384 be now adopted and that the bill be repassed as amended by the conference committee. Any questions, any discussion? The secretary would take the roll. Senator Bowden, for those voting under Rule 40.7. Thank you, Mr. President. I report that Senator Mann votes aye. Senator Mann votes aye. Senator Port votes aye. Senator Port votes aye. Senator McEwen votes aye. Senator McEwen votes aye. Senator Morrison votes aye. Senator Morrison votes aye. And Senator Klein votes aye. And Senator Klein votes aye. Mr. President. Senator Rasmussen, for those voting under Rule 40.7. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Barr votes no. Senator Barr votes no. Senator Duckworth votes no. Senator Duckworth votes no. And thank you, Mr. President. Senator Pratt votes aye. Senator Pratt votes aye.
All senators having voted, who desires a vote? The secretary will close the roll. There being 39 ayes and 26 noes, the, the, uh, the motion prevails. <laughs> Members, the House needs to really get this bill, so we really need to move forward. Third reading. Senate file number 1384, a bill for an act relating to state government, modifying labor policy provisions, et cetera. Third reading. <laughs> Members, we have two folks on the list, but they're really waiting for this bill, and they told me that they want us to move right away, so I'm trying to be as thoughtful as possible. So the, uh, the other two that's on the list, Mitchell and West, Westland. The secretary would take the role on final passage of, of Senate file 1384. Oh, let's go, sorry. <laughs> <clears throat> Members, please vote. Senator Bowden, for those voting under Rule 40.7. Thank you, Mr. President. I report that Senator Mann votes aye. Senator Mann votes aye. Senator Port votes aye. Senator Port votes aye. Senator McEwen votes aye. Senator McEwen votes aye. Senator Morrison votes aye. Senator Morrison votes aye. And Senator Klein votes aye. And Senator Klein votes aye. Senator Rasmussen, for those voting under Rule 40.7. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Barr votes no. Senator Barr votes no. Senator Duckworth votes no. Senator Duckworth votes no. And thank you, Mr. President. Senator Pratt votes aye. And Senator Pratt votes aye. Members, no matter how this vote goes forward, we ask that you remain uh, quiet in the, um, in the chambers. We still have some uh, business that we need to do. If you want to celebrate, you have to go outside. Um, one last thing, we did not let Senator Murphy speak because she's already spoke and gave her thank yous in the beginning, and we did not want to hold up any other minute. The secretary, um, all, all senators having voted who decided to vote or who won to vote, the secretary will close the roll. There being 40 ayes and 28 noes, the bill is 25 ayes, I'm sorry, 40 ayes and 25 noes, <laughs> the, uh, the bill is passed and its title agreed to. <laughs> Members, uh, we will revert back to the third order of business, messages from the House. Re remaining under the order of business of motions and uh, resolutions, we have reverted. Messages from the House. The secretary will read the message. Mr. President, I have the honor to announce that the House has adopted the recommendation and report of the conference committee on Senate file number 2995 and repass said bill in accordance with the report of the committee, so adopted. Senate file number 2995, a bill for an act relating to state government modifying provisions governing child care. Senate file number 2995 is herewith returned to the Senate. Signed, Patrick D. Murphy, Chief Clerk, House of Representatives. Members, uh, no action is required. We will now proceed to the ninth order of business. That doesn't say that. Uh, the uh, secretary will read the next message. <laughs> Mr. President, I have the honor to announce the adoption by the House of the following Senate concurrent resolution herewith returned. Senate concurrent resolution number seven, a Senate concurrent resolution relating to adjournment of the House of Representatives and Senate until 2024. Signed, Patrick D. Murphy, Chief Clerk, House of Representatives. Members, no action is required. Now we will proceed to the ninth order of business, motions and resolutions. We will adopt the author's motions as one motion all in favor say aye. aye. All those opposed say no. The motion prevails. <laughs> Members, we'll now proceed to the 13th order of business, announcements of Senate interests. Without objection, the following senators will be excused from today's session. Pratt from 10.30 a.m. to 4.30 p.m. Coleman. And here's the list. Coleman, Dames, Dornick, Dreheim, Farnsworth, Housley, Howe, Jasinski, Coran, Kroon, uh, Lang, Limmer, Miller, Nelson, Ucky, Weber, and Westrom from 410 to 420. Farnsworth and Wiesenberg from 840 p.m. to the end. Any other announcements of Senate interest? Senator Johnson.
Well, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, we've come to the end of a session, a session that has had many ups and many downs. But I just want to take a moment to reflect on where we are right now. I mean, literally right now. This is one of the most special times in, during your legislative session. The time when staff and everybody comes and gathers on the floor with members. Time when we know that we're going to end our time together this session, the many battles that we fought together, side by side or face to face, this is a special time. So thank you for being here. Thank you for being present with us in this moment. I want to reflect a little bit on the outcomes of this session. I want to reflect a little bit on what we have done and what we could do better. I'm sure many of you recall verbatim my beginning of session speech in which I talked a lot about the potential that we had with a nearly 50-50 Senate to have bipartisanship here, to have unity, to have shared Minnesota values in our legislation going forward. It was a rich opportunity. But sadly, I think it's one that we missed this session. When we saw towards the end of session here, a lot of the ideas that, that we came forward with from the Republican side being stripped out of conference committee reports, that hurt. That hurt 49% of Minnesota. When we watched our amendments on the floor and committee get voted down over and over and over again without consideration. That hurt 49% of Minnesota. What I learned in the six years of majority from 2017 to this last election, that you have to have input from the minority. Look, we don't agree. I don't agree with some of our caucus half the time. But the reality is you have to work together to get things right for the state. When we were in the majority, we worked not only bipartisanly, but tripartisanly to get those bills across the finish line. When the election came around, we ran on similar things, Republicans and Democrats. We ran on tax relief, getting the surplus back, making sure that we're supporting public safety, ensuring that we have education excellence across the state. That's what Minnesotans were asking for. That's what we promised. That's what Democrats were promising. And that's not what happened this session. We offered tax cuts, bigger rebate checks to taxpayers. Democrats have raised taxes by nearly $8.6 billion. We offer safe and sound policy for our communities. Democrats instead voted to make 92% of prison population more than 7,000 criminals eligible for earlier release. Education, Republicans offered a plan for historic education funding. But instead, Democrats ate up the funding that they gave with new mandates. Talk about Social Security tax. Senate Republicans led the charge for full elimination on taxation of Social Security benefits. We had opportunity after opportunity after opportunity on the floor to get that done for Minnesotans. Yet, even though we made a small movement there's still 26% of Minnesotans who receive that Social Security in income that are going to be taxed on it. I just wanted to say this, because Republicans represent nearly 50% of the state. And at the end of the day, this has been the most partisan session, not in my memory, but in the history of this state. That's something that we should really think about going into next year. I want to talk a little bit about next year. What I hope that we can do in the off season here as we prepare for next session, I really hope that we can build the relationships that this institution is known for. This is the body that is known for its ability to communicate with one another, Republicans, Democrats, independents. That's our legacy. What is our legacy going to be if we don't get that back? I hope that we can do that. 
This session, building those relationships, understanding the other side, trying to work together to find solutions that don't just help government, special interest, a few constituents, but solutions that help this state. We need to do better. We need unity. We need to look at Minnesota and not our campaigns moving forward. Mr. President, I just want to say thank you again to everybody here, Senator Dietzik, for your leadership. Through the things that you've been going through, it's been inspiring to our caucus and to me. We want to thank those who have been supporting this whole process, the staff, the revisor's office, the nonpartisan. Look, you guys just make this place run. I want to thank, personally, I want to thank Craig Sunday, my chief of staff, Jason, legislative director, Rachel and Gina over at comms, my LA, Rachel Bakke, and so many others that are out here working day in and day out to make this possible. So with that, thank you for the session. Thank you for this time together. Let's come back next year, more unified, figuring out ways to solve Minnesota's problems the opportunities that we have in this state to come together to do the work of this state. Thank you, Mr. President. Before we go to our Senate Majority Leader, I'll give my comments because we want her voice to be the last voice that we hear because she is our fearless leader. I want to say thanks to Senate Minority Leader Johnson and staff and all the others that he's already named for their uh, courtesy and kindness and professionalism. I also want to say thanks to Senate Majority Leader staff, including but not limited to Chris Runquist, who has demonstrated always his professionalism and work to make the floor sessions work. I also want to say thank you to, to my staff and the, my executive assistant uh, to the President, Shamika Bogan, and all the others for just their great work. I, I cannot do this without our front staff that you see sometimes here and sometimes you don't see. Uh, they have worked really, really, really hard, and that would be Tom Bodern, who is our Secretary of the Senate, Mike Lind, who is the first Assistant Secretary of the Senate, Jessica Tupper, who's the second uh, Secretary of the Senate, and Scott uh, Runduzel, who's the third Assistant uh, Secretary of the Senate. And then we have Melissa Mapes and the folks who are indexers and their staff and journal production staff and messengers. Members, we also want to thank um, Senate engrossment and, as I mentioned, nonpartisan staffs, the sergeant at arms, the pages, and state patrol just for all of their hard work. And I definitely want to also thank Carl Demmer, who's here, who is helping us save our session by making sure that we have a backup system. Thanks to every senator who's made my first year as president memorable. Um, last but certainly not least, um, I saved our Senate majority leader, uh, Carrie Desick, for last, who has led with grace courage in spite of her health challenges and with the heart of a servant leader. For you, I am grateful. And thank you to each person that's here. And those are my closing comments. And now we will go to our Senate Majority Leader, Carrie Deasy. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, and before I get started, uh, DFL members will have a very, very, very short caucus up in the caucus room when we adjourn. Uh, Mr. President and members, this has been an unprecedented session in many ways. And it is only fitting that we end today with a karaoke session. <laughs> we've had some good debates. We've had some partisan debates. We've had some really long debates. But in the end, we passed some historic and transformational legislation. As we leave here today, we're kinda, you'll, have, you'll hear a theme. Senator Johnson and Senator Champion uh, both thank staff. And so as we leave here today, we're going to go our separate ways, talk about the legislation we passed and didn't pass with our constituents. But before we do that, I do want to take time to thank our staff. As you've heard, and for anybody out there listening, Senator Johnson say, um, President Champion say, we have great staff. We all have legislative assistants that work hard to make us look good. We have committee administrators that make the meetings run well. We have both the partisan research and media staff, both GOP and DFL staff. This is a group that works tirelessly to make us look good and sound smart. 
I want to thank the nonpartisan staff who work round the clock this entire session. And this has been no easy task. We've taken on a lot of issues, and we've worked hard, and they have stepped up and worked hard and kept going all session long. And this has been especially true the last few days as staff scrambled to deal with our technical sound system issues here, and they worked late into the night the other night, and so thank you. They made sure that we could keep going, and they had a backup plan, clearly, and I'm glad they did. So thank you. I want to thank Lexi Stangle, Eric Nauman, and our Senate Council Research and Fiscal staff. They help us understand our bills, especially those very, very technical bills. They make sure that our bills get to committee and the floor in the right order. The work of the nonpartisan staff to directly support the processing and tracking of this legislation has been critically important. Thank you to the hardworking staff, including draft support specialists, Senate indexing, Melissa Mapes and Senate engrossing team, and the Senate journal, Dan Olson and the purchasing and duplicating team. I want to thank the assistant secretaries, Mike Lynn, Jessica Tupper, Jessica Tupper, Linda Jackson, and Scott, and I'm going to screw up your name here, Radinswell, for working with Secretary Bodern to ensure that the Senate runs smoothly. There's been a lot of us that this is a first year and a large learning curve, um, and so thank you to everybody up there. You did a fabulous job, and we truly appreciate it, and we appreciate your guidance. I want to thank you, uh, the Sergeant at Arms, Van Lindquist, and all the sergeants for handling their job so well, and uh, again, for the State Patrol. We've had some big crowds out there, and they keep it running smoothly, and they keep us, uh, they keep us safe. I want to thank Steve. Uh, and I'm going to pronounce the name again wrong, Sven. Well, Steve and his media services staff. <laughs> they allow Minnesotans to watch us and to know what's going on here. And as someone who spent several weeks watching from home, it was very important because several times I had to call, why are you like watching? Why are you taping something that's already been delayed? We're in session. So thank you to all of them for helping keep the public to know what we're doing. I also want to make sure that we have um, HR staff and payroll staff, and I'm sure I missed somebody, so I apologize for that. Um, but as we've said many, many times, we could not do that without the staff. So thank you to everybody around the room that is here today, because from the bottom of my heart, I thank you. You make this place run smoothly, and again, we could not do it without you. You, and I want everybody in the public to know, these are dedicated staffers. They are true public service servants. They work behind the scenes. They don't come here for the headlines. They don't get to talk. They come here because of their commitment to the Senate and to our state. And so again, thank you all. You are the valued public servants. And I, we can't say it enough. We could not do this job without you. And I'd be remiss if I didn't thank those people sitting up front to our pages. Thank you for being here. Thank you for helping us here on the floor. Thank you for the committees. I hope you enjoyed your time with us because we enjoyed the time getting to know you. So thank you. Uh, members, for me, this has been a very unique session. I want to thank Senator Johnson for his partnership. I want to thank the DFL assistant leaders and the leadership team for stepping up and filling in. And I want to thank all of you. We had a lot of new members, and I apologize. You know, I didn't really get to know a lot of you, so I hope to do that, you know, in the interim and next year. Um, you know, we made it work, though. We worked hard for Minnesotans. Senator Johnson talked that, you know, we didn't always work together. Um, but I think on a lot of times, and a lot of DFL bills, you know, there were times when we took a lot of GOP amendments. And we listened to the comments they made, and I can think of several big bills um, where I do think the GOP made an impact. And they, they worked together with the leads, um, the chairs, and the leads worked together. And while we may not have always agreed, I think the product became better. So thank you. And I'll say that we ended on a high note tonight because these last few bills have been bipartisan bills with a lot of support and it took a team effort with all of us working together. And I think that's what people want to say. So to all the staff and members out here, I want you to take time to enjoy the summer and fall with your families and constituents. And again, I look forward to getting to know you better and to literally figuring out what we're going to do next year and working with you next year to improve the lives of all Minnesotans. And with that, Members, Mr. President, I move that the Senate do now adjourn until Monday, February 12th, 2024, at 12 noon. On that motion, any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. Aye. 
All those opposed say no. The motion prevails. The Senate is now adjourned.